Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore and welcome to the MuseScore Cafe. So uh, welcome to anyone who's new, welcome back to returning uh, visitors and this is my weekly series where we talk about some aspect of making music using MuseScore. So uh, I usually have a theme that we talk about on any given week and the theme that I've chosen for today, uh, I'm, calling it, I'm calling it correctness, which um, is sort of a highfalutin word. That it means getting the details right when you're entering scores. There are lots of aspects to what I might mean by this, but I'll tell you that it this uh, was prompted by a discussion in the accessibility space within the community where we're talking about uh, if people are wanting to create Braille editions of music, uh, which obviously is something we've been talking about all month, um, we want to make sure that we're starting from an accurate file. And so I want to talk about what that means uh, for you know, for things to be accurate. What does it mean for the score uh, to be correct? What What are the kinds of details we want to make sure that we have right? Some of them, most of them are details that you care about regardless of whether you're trying to export and create Braille or anything like that. They're just important details anyhow. Um, before I go any further, I do want to take care of a couple housekeeping things. One is um, I'm a... Uh, uh, I noticed somehow that today's cafe session wasn't showing up in the list of upcoming sessions, and I noticed that like 15 minutes ago, so I had to really quickly create this session. So I hope that didn't mess anyone up. Obviously, the people who are here found it, but I, I, I'm wondering if anyone like tried to get on a half an hour ago and, and like be ready for it and discovered it wasn't there. If so, I apologize, but I don't even know what happened, but we, we seem to be good now. So uh, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is I want to give you a heads up. I've uh, ever since uh, we, I started putting together my MuseScore 4 course, I've always intended to do some like workshops, some live uh, and recorded workshops that maybe go into depth on certain topics, have a beginner session, have other sessions and all. And I'm looking at planning the first one for next month. And probably it's going to be a Saturday. And most likely, um, I think I even picked a tentative date uh, of, uh, yeah, this is just tentative, uh, but the, the Saturdays are the 16th, 23rd, or 30th that it would most likely be, and I'm more likely to pick the 23rd. Um, but in any case, just something to mark your calendars for uh, that I will probably be doing in conjunction with the MuseCore 4 course, an in-depth workshop where we uh, have Q&A sessions, we do some demos, we do some exercises together, et cetera. So it's going to be you know, kind of an all-day-ish thing, although I recognize that what all day means is different uh, for depending on where you live in the world. So uh, yeah, I still got a lot of details to work out. So this is sort of the heads up that that's coming in around a month, all right? Um, so uh, that's a couple things that I want to get kind of out of the way. So. Uh, let's get into now the topic that I said I wanted to talk about, which has to do with this idea of correctness. And I'm going to show you the specific uh, thread that kind of started this, and then we're going to take a look at the specific score. There's a lot of discussion in this thread about the details. Um, and uh, the idea is here that um, we have a, a score that uh, was created in MuseScore by I don't know who. And, um, you know, there's a lot of scores available on MuseScore.com that, uh, you know, are versions of particular pieces. And uh, we don't know how correct they are, right? I mean, this is the case if you are, you know, downloading classical music uploaded by someone else or, or whatever. We don't know how correct it is. And even if it's an original piece, um, there's still a sense of correctness. So first of all, they might have wrong notes, right? If that's like an actual piece that someone else wrote and then someone has uploaded it to musescore.com, they might have entered wrong notes. They might have gotten wrong markings. They might have done any number of things that are obviously just wrong. But even when you're creating your own original music and then you know no one can say your notes are wrong because they're your notes, we can still talk about the right and wrong way of entering certain markings into MuseScore. And I'm going to give you one super practical example right off the bat. So this is the piece we're going to be looking at. This is um, 
uh, the Night of the Sleepy Panda. This is the piece we're going to look at, and this is a, a version that has been posted, and we're just going to talk about it. So let's take a look at things like, uh, um, trying to, uh, I'm going to see if I see one that's obviously wrong. And, and frankly, I don't see anything that's obviously wrong, and that's great already. But what if this dynamic marking, someone hadn't entered it as a dynamic marking. They just entered text. They just entered staff text and typed MP instead of uh, actually using um, the dynamics for that. Well, it's going to look okay, but it's not going to translate correctly when it's time to export that to Music XML or to convert to Braille or anything like that. And it's also not going to play back correctly if you don't get those details right. This is commonly an issue with things like the, the hairpins and the pedal markings, where sometimes people might add a pedal marking and then say, oh, that's not the length I want. Let me just drag it to be a different length. And when you do that, the pedal marking, you can kind of see on my screen here, it's adjusting to show uh, where it's attached. And I think if you're using a screen reader, it might read that. Of course, you wouldn't be using drag. You'd be using shift left, shift right, which is the correct way to do it. But I guess that is my point. When you drag things, like say I wanted this mezzo piano not to be here, but I didn't want it to show up until later in the measure. I could drag it to later in the measure, but notice it still shows that dotted line. It's still attached to the first note. So even though I dragged it later, it's not really later. It's really still attached to the first note, but showing up later. These are the kinds of details that will then cause the playback to be wrong because the dynamic change will happen at the wrong spot. And it will mess up people who are then trying to trans, you know, to transcribe this into Braille. So, um, or into any other format. So these are the kinds of things that I'm going to be talking about. So we're going to look at the process of kind of going through your scores, whether it's your own original music or whether it's an arrangement, you know, a, a transcription of an existing piece to be as correct as possible. Make sure the notes are all correct, the markings are all correct, and everything has been added correctly so that it's really a faithful rendition of the piece. The other thing that that's important for is... Um, I mentioned playback. If the dynamic is attached to the wrong note, then it's going to play back on the wrong note. But also the next version of MuseScore that comes out, I don't mean the next version, but anytime a new version of MuseScore comes out, the default layout might subtly shift because there's always improvements to the default layout. And all these manual adjustments you've made may start to become sort of wrong, counterproductive counterproductive. And, you know, you've dragged a, a dynamic marking to look like it's over exactly over that F um, or F sharp. But if the layout changes, maybe it's not going to be over that F sharp at all anymore because now that measure is wider than it was before. So there's all sorts of reasons why you want to get those details right. So anyhow, that's my um, my sort of practical um uh, example of the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about. So, um, yeah, we're going to, I'm going to start on this process now and, uh, we'll see what comes up. And by all means, uh, feel free to be asking questions, making observations and so forth. But what I'm going to do is I'm now going to bring up the, uh, the PDF file that it is supposedly a representation of, and we're going to see how correct it all is. And so I'm just going to, um, I want to get this thing to float. And so I can be seeing it while I look at MuseScore. And here we go. All right. So I can see everything that I want at the same time here now. Um, so first of all, Night of the Sleepy Panda. So already, if we want to be really technical, I can see a, a, a detail that's wrong here. Night should be capitalized, right? So right now, I'm just going to go through and do a proofreading job, right? I want to I want to make sure that things actually, you know, have the right text, the right markings, and the right notes. And so let's get that going first. So yeah, night should be capitalized. Night and then of the is not because, um, you know, title case, you generally don't, um, 
uh, capitalized prepositions and articles. All right, so there's additional information here about copyright stuff that really doesn't belong in the title frame. T copyright uh, information belongs in the footer. So now I'm a little curious, is it there in the footer also? And it looks like not. So, you know, I'm actually going to take this and I'm just going to copy and paste that text. So copyright. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of weird the way this is all worded. So I'm just going to copy all that text and then go to file project properties. And under copyright, I'll paste it in and I'm going to edit it. So it's going to say copyright and then is reserved to, no, that stuff doesn't all belong there. It's copyright and then that copyright symbol. Twenty twenty Trinity College. There we go. So now the copyright message is actually correct, and you know that's always good. Um, so uh, and yes, uh, thanks everyone checking in in the uh, chat and uh, you know giving updates on where you're coming from and how things are going. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so it's good to see people here. All right, so that's I'm gonna now delete that that uh, subtitle there, because it really didn't belong there. All right, um, Edric Tan, Tan is the uh, composer, and it says arranged by Nathan. So I don't know if Nathan made some, um, you know, editorial arrangement decisions, or if he really means he just uh, entered it into MuseScore, but that's the kind of thing we're gonna find out. All right, so now I want to start looking at, I'm gonna leave that alone anyhow, is uh, what I'm going to say about that. Uh, I wanna actually get this to be the width of the page. There we go, all right. Okay, so um, let's look now at the actual music. Now I have to say, I don't have a uh, a set process that I use when I proofread. I, I do a lot of proofreading of you know my own work, but I, I don't have a specific process like this is how I do my proofreading, right? Um, it's I, I make it up as I go along. I have to say. Um, so what I'm going to do first though is get the obvious stuff out of the way. Obvious stuff is to me now looking at this, and this is unfortunately a very visual thing comparing to a PDF, right? But this is, you know, we do it uh, to get it correct, and then we hope that that also allows it to be um, more readily accessible for a blind user using a screen reader or exported to Braille. So the first obvious thing I see is the tempo marking. It says quarter note equals 90, but it's missing the text Andante Cantabile. So let's add that. Let's uh, double click this here and add Andante Cantabile. All right, there we go. Now the other thing that I notice, and this is, um, you know, when it comes to correctness, the actual thing, formatting decisions, like how many measures are on a system, you know, that's a judgment call. And maybe that was Nathan's judgment call to say he's going to put more measures on this system than the original had. But I also am looking at his score and it doesn't look like he's put in any system breaks at all. It looks like he's just going with the defaults. Um, let me make sure uh, that that he hasn't turned off the display of breaks. So let me show you how to do that. I'm gonna make sure nothing is selected by pressing escape a bunch of times. And now in the properties panel, uh, see where it says show, it'll say show invisible, show formatting, show frames, show page margins, page margins is turned off. Formatting is turned on, meaning uh, things like system breaks, if they were in there would still be, uh, um, uh, if, uh, what am I saying? If there was a system break, we would be seeing it because the formatting is, is enabled here. So I'm happy with that. So the question is, is the tempo anchored, anchored to the first note? Now that is a very good question. And, um, uh, there's a number of ways of finding out question, uh, answers to questions like that. 
one of them is to take the thing and just drag it a little bit and see what the little arrow tells you, right? That's one method. I'm going to now reset all that little dragging I just did. Another method, though, is just to, after clicking it, check the status bar. It'll say tempo, quarter note equals 90, measure 1, beat 1, staff 1. So that tells me it's, it's, it is attached to the correct beat. At least it's correct, connected to beat one, staff one. So that is good to know. Same if I select the dynamic marking, it says measure one, beat one, staff one. Oh, by the way, a common error that we might need to deal with is some of these dynamic markings might be attached to the top staff and some might be attached to the bottom staff. That is also going to mess up playback and mess up music XML or Braille export, right? So, we're going to want to check all of these dynamics to see uh, if they all say staff one. So I've clicked that hairpin. It says staff one. Select this hairpin over here. It says staff one. So, so far, so good. So what I'm saying is, though, about the formatting, yeah, it could be a um, conscious decision to have the formatting not match the PDF. And that's OK. It's okay if the formatting doesn't match the PDF because every editor gets to make their own decisions there. But it's going to make my job of proofreading this easier if I make it match this. And I think it's going to be better all around. It looks like Nathan was able to get it to all fit on one page, whereas the original version uh, took two pages. But I'm going, to, I'm going to say that that's okay. So I'm going to add breaks to mimic the original layout. We can always remove them later, right? Can always remove them later. All right. Um, so one, two, three, four measures. And I'm going to guess, actually, if I look at the PDF, is it consistently four measures per, per system? So far, so far, so far, yes. So far, yes. So far, yes. So far, yes. Even that measure is a little funny. The four measures per system. Yeah. So it's actually four measures per system consistently. So I'm just going to do that. I'm going to select all, control A, and then go to format add remove system breaks and you'll see break systems every four measures when i click ok there it's going to add those system breaks now every four bars for me so they are they are where they belong so this thing about system breaks every four bars let me let me just address that as a general topic because it comes up every once in a while um they're usually in most printed music over the course of the last however many half a millennium <laughs> that we have of uh, printed music, for, it's not like four measures per line is a magic number that we always want to adhere to. Typically, um, it, it's going to depend on the music, right? If you've got a lot of 16th notes, you might not be able to fit four measures conveniently. But if your music is mostly half notes, you might, can, you might comfortably fit more than four measures on a system. And, you know, most music isn't all half notes or all 16th notes. There might be half notes here and then 16th notes there. And so you're going to have different numbers of measure per system throughout a piece. And that's normal. So MuseScore's default layout is going to try to optimize around that to get as much as it can on each system. And often that's a good, an a good answer. But there's basically two specific places where four measures per system is what you want. One is lead sheets. Uh, lead sheets, uh, we typically do four measures per system, although not, not necessarily always. Like think about a first ending and a second ending. You might have an eight measure phrase, but then there's a first ending and a second ending. And that second, so you might want to put five bars on one system so that the first ending and second ending can kind of live together on the same system, right? So but the idea that you want to average four measures per system is really common for lead sheets. And it's also really common for mu music for children. And that's kind of what this is here. This is meant to be a beginning piano piece. It looks actually a little more, you know, it's not be real beginner, like, you know, first month of lessons, but it is a, it is a common thing. So, um, and one reason why that four measures per system is common for lead sheets is, you know, 
in lead sheets, we're reading off of chord symbols. Some people are reading the melody, yeah, but we're going to spend an awful lot of time just reading the chord symbols. And we want to understand the phrase structure of the music relative to those chord symbols. And seeing them in those four measure phrases is going to make sense. And the thing is, a lot of music is four measure phrases. I didn't just pick that number four out of a hat, right? It's it's musically significant. A lot of music is based on four measure phrases. So typically we want four measures per system to match the phrase structure if we can do that without compromising anything else. So Colleen is mentioning earlier about page turns, and that's huge, especially in uh, ensemble music. Um, you know, you you don't want to have to turn pages while you're playing some intricate passage. If you're if you're looking at the clarinet part in a symphony or something, we typically try to organize it so the page turns happen during rests or during whole notes, and especially whole notes of the notes that only require one hand, so you can be flipping with the other hand. Right? There's a lot of subjective uh, thinking that goes into planning for page turns. Now, if the piece is only two pages then you don't have to worry about it so much because we can put two pages side by side, right? We don't need to turn pages unless someone does something really poor planning wise, like print it both sides of one piece of paper. That's not good planning. Usually we plan it so that in a book or in any, you know, you have a title page first and then open it up. So the two pages are side by side. So in any case, um, we, we don't care about it as much for two facing pages where that page break happens, but we do where the page actually turns. So that's a, a really good, uh, a good important thing. So yeah, any, any instrument that you play with both hands, which frankly is pretty much all instruments. Most instruments require both hands. Some give you a little more freedom than others. Obviously brass instruments, uh, for the most part, you only need one hand for. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you all saw, we talked about this, uh, Allison brought up during uh, office hours yesterday, uh, the video that's been floating around of a performance of a horn player with no hands playing horn with his feet. It is impressive, quite impressive. So um, uh, it is possible. But in any case, um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I wanted to get those four bar breaks in there so that things match what I actually have on the page. But now I'm going to go back to the proofing and seeing if, uh, things match what I have. So, um, uh, I'm just going to look at notes. So first of all, I said, I want to proofread notes and go for correction, go for correctness here. So let's start from the beginning and make sure, okay, treble clef, bass clef, five sharps, five sharps, three, four, three, four, I'm making sure the basic structure of the piece is correct. And now I want to follow the uh, actual melody here. It starts with a C sharp. Let's actually turn up my volume more. Mm -mm. Um, C sharp, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp. I'm just guessing on pitches, actually. A sharp, F sharp, D sharp. I should actually turn on my keyboard because that would be good. And I do what I'm doing, singing the lines while I'm proofing. I don't always do it. And it's not always possible, of course, if you've got a big chord, I can't sing an entire chord at once. But when I do have single note lines, I, I do like to sing them. And I'll tell you why, and then you can think about this. Um, uh, oh, and that was a really good question that just came in about playing it and reading the PDF, and I'll address that after, after I finish my thought here. Um, it's a really common thing when you're looking when you're trying to proofread something that you you see what you think you see rather than what you really see i would have to imagine the same is true for braille um there's sometimes where you know if you see a particular word and there's some letter in it that's just you know that word was misspelled you might just kind of ignore that misspelling as you're reading the thing because you understood the context of the word despite there being a wrong letter in it right we're we're pretty good at that um and uh i worry that we're so good at that that i will miss errors when um when just sort of eyeballing things that I will miss things. And so I want to actually 
like call out letter names, sing pitches. I want to do what it takes to make sure that I am verbalizing, that I am really being conscious of every marking, of every note, et cetera. So the idea that I might just let MuseScore play this and compare it to the PDF and see if it, it uh, sounds like I expect, absolutely I do that. I do that quite a lot. Um, so especially if it's my own piece, because that's how I know if I got it right, because I'm the only one who knows if it's right or not is by, by what it sounds like, right? But so I'm going to play this right now. I don't know how it's supposed to sound, but I can certainly look at my PDF and see if it seems believable. All right, well, that seems like it matches uh, what I have here. So um, that so much is, is, um, is uh, yeah, that's all making sense to me. All right, so ba -do -da, ba -do -dum, and then the left hand is that bum, bum, ba -dum, over and over again, right? Boom, bum, ba -dum, boom, boom, ba -dum, boom, 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 four times. Now, there is a different thing. Um, uh, that's happening here that I'll talk about in a second, but I want to address Elizabeth's question. What kinds of things might you want to be careful about? Well, that's a great question, and I don't have a ready-made answer for you, but I'll, I'll be interested in hearing other people's answers uh, via the chat here. Um, you know, the thing is, if a note is misspelled and harmonically, you're not going to be able to tell that from the playback, right? If there had been a, a, a C sharp that was spelt D flat, Playback ain't going to care, right? So um, that kind of detail isn't going to be captured right. Also, things like if the dynamic markings are, you know, if it was M, if it was F instead of FF, are you going to tell the difference by just by listening to it? Well, no, probably not. I mean, if it's F instead of P, you probably will, right? If there's huge errors in the dynamics. But there's subtle things like that that you will miss. There's any number of things having to do with note length that are really easy to miss, especially when you're using the damper pedal. Because if I use the damper pedal, um, my hand, not on the keys anymore, those notes are sustaining, right? Um, because I'm sustaining uh, with my foot. And so there's all sorts of things where the sustain of the instrument will mask errors in duration. That also happens in harp music and guitar music. Um, right. So there's any number of errors and there's just lots of things that, you know, if the music is sufficiently simple, then I feel like I can look at, you know, I can listen to the playback, match it to what I'm hearing. And I mean, match it to what I'm seeing and catch a lot of errors. But if it's some highly complex chromatic piece, no, nah, I'm not going to be able to tell, gee, was that leap from from this note to that note exactly right? Or was it, well, I can probably pick out a tritone versus, you know, it, was that top note a B flat or a B natural? If you got perfect pitch, Elizabeth, I know you knew which that one was. But um, uh, if I'm hearing, right, I, I if I'm looking at the sheet music for that and I hear that, no way can I tell if each of those notes was correct or not. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. All right. So, um, so yeah, that's, and also I will absolutely, uh, um, uh, you know, want to see other people's uh, feedback on that, what kinds of things you might want to look out for. So I, I look at that as a uh, one thing, you know, uh, I guess I will listen and match to the playback and see what I can see that way. But no, that is not going to be my main go-to. I'm also going to be doing all these other things. So, um, so coming back to the piece and looking at from the terms of correctness now. I've I've now ascertained that the notes are good. I also want to check things like the beaming. The be uh and again, these are editorial decisions where maybe someone might choose to beam notes differently, especially in three, four. Some people might choose to beam boom 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 boom. They might choose to beam all four of those eighth notes together and then tie to a quarter. That is legitimate. It is it is a legitimate choice to beam groups of four eighth notes in three, four, especially the first four eighths of a measure. But the original did not, and this version doesn't either. I think MuseScore by default only beams three, four in groups of two. It beams four, four in groups of four, but three, four in groups of two. So in any case, the beaming all looks good. The ties look good. Um, so uh, 
let's let's keep let, let's uh I, the, the the pedal is the thing i want to come to because it's not matching right and also i see fingerings in the uh original that are not here i want to get those fingerings in so but let's let's get the rest of this stuff in first the dynamics the mp the crescendo starting and i'm going to click the handles to make sure they're added correctly okay so actually there is a a slight difference in this crescendo this the crescendo here starts on beat three of the first bar but in the original the uh the crescendo stops right on the eighth note boom 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 right on that eighth note and it doesn't sustain through the tie but in the music score version it extends through the tie well i feel like i would like to shorten that but I think some of you may see what's coming here. The right hand only has a dotted half note. So there is no easy way to shorten this crescendo to end after only two beats, given that there is nothing in that top staff to attach that to, right? If I try to shorten this crescendo, it's gonna shorten it all the way to the previous note. There is nothing there on beat three to attach that hairpin to. Um, so I have two choices here. I can either live with that and say, well, what's the difference really between entering the ending that crescendo on the, the G sharp? But, okay. So first of all, this is piano music, right? So literally there's no difference. You can't make that note that G sharp tied to a quarter louder after striking that G sharp. That crescendo is not going to crescendo through the G sharp. The G sharp is gonna be the volume it is, and that's it. But if this was music for a wind instrument, I, I would be more concerned with that difference because the original says, get to the G sharp and then stop getting louder. And what I have here says, hit that G sharp, but keep getting louder even after playing that G sharp, right? You're supposed to keep getting louder while sustaining that G sharp. Because this is piano music, um, I don't have to worry about that particular distinction. So I could live with this, right? Um, and Peter, I do see your thing about ties. I'm gonna come back to that. Um, but if I wanted to uh, capture the length of that hairpin correctly. Um, I'm gonna show you how to do it. It's a hack, okay? So let me address the subject of hacks also. Hacks are not your friend when it comes to music XML or Braille export. Hacks like what I'm about to do is gonna put a bunch of crap in the score that doesn't really belong there. And it's going to export to Music XML, and someone's going to see it and go and, and think that there's something to it. There's some reason for this there. And they're going to try to translate it to Braille, and there it's going to be weird. So let me show you what the hack is, and then people who might be interested in Braille translation can think about um, you know, whether you would ever want to see this hack. But this hack will give the right answer. Before I show you the hack, though, I also want to say that this is like number one on Martin's list, like Martin Tantacruel, the guy who kind of uh, is in charge of all things MuseScore these days, this is his number one pet peeve about MuseScore is that there is no way to shorten this hairpin so that it's only um, two beats long instead of, you know, so that it stops on beat three instead of extending to the end of the measure. So that ability is coming. It might come in 4.2. If not, it will definitely come in 4.3. So within the year, I expect that to be possible just to directly shorten that hairpin. But I'm going to show you the hack. I'm going to go to node input mode and I'm going to go to voice two. So control alt two. And uh, my keyboard logger thing is decided to not work. And sorry about that. I'll just narrate as I go. Um, so control alt two and I'll type five, zero, and then V to make it invisible, zero, V to make it invisible again, and zero, V to make it invisible again. So now I have three invisible rests there. That's something I can attach to. So now I can select that hairpin and use uh, control F to shorten it one notch. And now it ends on the proper beat. It ends before beat three. So that's, um, uh, that solves the problem 
for from the perspective of making this make if if it had been a playback issue right if it had been flute or something it would make the hairpin stop at the right place make the crescendo stop at the right place it'll make it display properly make it print properly and it will be you know relatively future proof as far as like if the layout changes that's okay the hairpin is attached to the right beat um but it is it's got these invisible rests now now Music XML should capture the fact that that rest is invisible. So someone working from a Music XML file will notice, hey, that that uh, that Music XML file is showing uh, an invisible rest, so probably I don't need to account for it in the Braille. But an automatic converter from Braille from Music XML to Braille, who knows what it's going to do with those invisible rests? It might put those invisible rests there, and then you might it might just be there as rests in the Braille that don't need to be there. So I'm wary of hacks like this if you're mostly concerned with things like music out music xml export i'd be very leery of doing this all right um so chris has the the exact other um suggestion that i was going to mention and i'm glad you brought it up it absolutely would work to take that hairpin and just attach it to the bottom staff instead so in other words i could delete that hairpin and now attach it to the bottom staff by selecting the appropriate range, hitting the shortcut for hairpin, which is the you know less than sign, and then hit X to flip it above the staff. That totally gives the right result, but now it's on the wrong staff and the MuseScore playback may or may not match it up with the dynamic properly. If that, you know, if there was a dynamic on right before it, uh, it wouldn't necessarily align it properly. So it's another hack that will produce good results in some ways, but not other ways. So that's, um, it is something you can do, but I would be really nervous about doing that. And to be honest, I don't know braille wise um, what the proper thing is here. My assumption is in piano music dynamics would go uh after the first after the right hand staff but or within the right hand staff to be i have that's one thing i haven't gotten to yet is dealing with dynamics I've, I've looked at the dynamic at the beginning of a score but i've never thought about dynamic changes after that but i think they appear normally within that right hand staff unless unless they're meant to apply to the left hand only and so um yeah, I would be I'd be a little nervous about that. So um, Steiner's got a good suggestion here also. Um, uh, OK, OK, so this is a really brilliant idea that you have here, um, Steiner, but I don't think it's going to work. So let's try. It. I'm going to undo those changes, all those changes I just did. I'm going to undo those invisible rests because I'm not that crazy about them anyhow. I'm going to do the thing that you said of changing that G to a half note shorten the hairpin and now and you mentioned tying it but uh th there shouldn't be a need to now i've shortened the hairpin now that that's only a half note and now i'm gonna dot that half note i think MuseScore is not going to i think it's going to extend the hairpin oh my god steinar oh my god that's brilliant i didn't think that was going to work that might be a bug but eh, it's a bug that we don't need to fix right Oh my God, is it really that simple? Holy crap. Um, sorry, <laughs> let me put in some eighth notes here and see if uh, I can really attach that thing anywhere. If I can attach it right there and then again, change this to a half note dotted. Look at, well, that sort of did something funny, but it definitely worked. Well, I'm, I'm, it sort of works, sort of works. Yeah, I, I, I still would wonder, okay, I'm going to find out if this survives save and re it's the kind of thing that I'm a little scared won't survive a save and restore. And I, I'll tell you what else also, I think that only worked because there was something there in the left hand, but this is brilliant. This is great. This is great information. I'm going to save this thing and I'm going to close it. And I'm going to reopen it and see if it survived. And I, I suspect it will, but we'll find out. It did survive. So, so far, so good.
But here's what I'm a little afraid of. I think if the left hand had been a dotted half note, yeah, as soon as I change the left hand to a dotted half note, that gets lost. The reason it worked is because there was something on some staff somewhere for that hairpin to attach to. Um, it in other in music or internals term internal terms, there's a uh, segment on beat three that that hairpin can say that it ended at. That's what allowed it to work. So if you wanted to, you could use an invisible staff. Oh my gosh! Okay, I got I gotta try this because. This is kind of interesting. I'm going to add another staff here. I'm going to add, because this this doesn't relate to the topic exactly, but it's a pretty brilliant little workaround if it works. I'm going to add a third staff. I'm going to fill that staff with eighth notes. N, four, zero, 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 zero. And now, can I take this? So, yeah. So I, I, I would, I would still have to do the trick of, you know, making this the right length, making that note the right length, and then changing that to a dotted half, and it works. Now the question is, will it still work if I hide that staff of eighth notes? And no. As soon as I hid that staff of eighth notes, it didn't work anymore. So, so anyhow, there's promise. There is like possibilities in here, but I how how much time do we want to spend on these hacks, knowing that a real solution is coming in the future, and these hacks don't do us any favors, really? So I feel like, um, yeah, I just don't want I I don't want to have to rely on that business. I I don't want to rely on it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and use the uh, the trick that Steinar used here that happens to work because the left hand lined up properly. And realistically, for piano music, that that should be the case. That you'll never have a hairpin end in the middle of a whole note for a piano because that doesn't make sense. Or if it does, it's as an editor, I say, correct it. That's just a bad notation. Hairpins can't end in the middle of whole notes for piano because pianos don't have that kind of control. So, um, uh, so yeah, there's probably additional um, ways and you can keep experimenting to see if there's other things you could do in that area to get things to work. But um yeah, you just have to decide how much it's worth of your time. So anyhow, I'm glad we took that little detour um, because it is good information. So I, I want to come back now to Peter's question about uh, the ties. The ties are shorter. Now, you don't mean that they are like fewer notes. You just mean physically a different length. And no, I'm not going to worry about that. That is an engraving decision. You know, how much space do we put between notes? And actually, there is a reason for that that maybe I will deal with here. If we look at the original PDF, you see that that first system was not indented. But MuseScore, by default, indents that first system. If I go to Format, Style, and right here on the Score tab, turn off the Enable Indentation, we'll see that now that indentation, indentation is gone and the tie is noticeably longer as a result because the notes are spaced out more. Um, is that use, is that good? I don't know, this is another editorial decision. Um, normally in piano music, in most, mm, most classical music and a lot of other music as well, we do expect to indent that first system. Uh, I don't know that there was any value in not indenting it, but I will tell you this. Here is the value, actually. The nice thing about not indenting that first system is it allows the measures to be more similar width. Because remember, we made all the measures for, uh, you know, four per system, which allows their widths to be relatively consistent. They're not necessarily exactly consistent because the first system has the time signature and the others don't. And there's going to be measures later on where there's no eighth notes. And so that last measure gets narrower. So it's not like a given. We don't necessarily want the bar lines to align from system to system. I've talked about this before when talking about lead sheets. For lead sheets specifically, there's value in having the measures more or less the same width because it makes the chord symbol spacing more logical. But 
If there's not chord symbols involved, it's actually counterproductive to have your measures the same width because it makes the page look too similar. In other words, while you're reading across and you're reading and you look down at your hands and you look back up at the piano, at the sheet music and try to find your space, there's any number of subtle cues that we use when looking back up at the page to find our place. And if the measures are all the same width, so the bar lines all line up from one system to the next, that removes one of those subtle cues that allows you to find your place. So anytime you see someone struggling, like they look down at their hands and they look back up and now they can't find their place, it is a common thing. I've taught enough beginning piano lessons that I know that that is a common thing, that you lose your place every time you look up and down. And that is a reason why we don't normally line up bar lines. In fact, Elaine Gould, right, the author of uh, Behind Bars, uh, makes a, a strong point about that in both her book and in a recent podcast interview I saw, uh, I heard, uh, of saying, no, don't do that. You know, go out of your way to misalign the bar lines. So, um, because this does have that four measures per line thing, and that does give me, uh, turning off the, the indentation does give me somewhat more consistent uh, measure widths without causing any problems. I'm gonna go ahead and leave indentation off. The bar lines don't align perfectly, so I'm happy about that. Um, so there you go. Um, oh, so, oh, you're talking about the slurs, not the ties, Peter. Ah, the slurs. Oh my gosh, look at that, Peter. Wow, yes, brilliant. You are absolutely right. Look at what has happened here. Um, wow, and I totally missed that, but I hadn't, uh, man, I hadn't gotten to the slurs yet. I looked at the dynamics. So Peter is absolutely right. Look at that. The slur goes from the C sharp to the G sharp and it attaches at the end of the C sharp. But whoever entered this, they did something funny here. I think, here's what they did. They attached that slur what the heck is that even attached to? It's attached to the bar line. That's not even possible. Someone did something to drag that slur. I'm going to press control R. Okay, that's what they did. They attached that slur to the F and then just dragged it to look like it attached to the G sharp. And uh, that worked when there was only when there were more measures on the page but remember how i said that as soon as you change the, the width of a measure these manual adjustments don't make sense oh my gosh that's a perfect example if i delete that system break that same look at that look at that look at that this looks perfect right to the eye this this slur looks like it's going to that g sharp but it's actually attached to the F sharp, as we can see if I click that handle, you see the dotted line going to the F sharp. This slur looks like it's going to the G sharp, but it's actually going to the F sharp. And it looks fine until we add that system break. And as soon as I add that system break, we see that that manual adjustment was entirely wrong. It was adjusting the length of it just enough to make it to the G sharp when the measure was narrower. But now that the measure is wider, that manual adjustment is not good anymore. Oh my God, Peter, love you. Um, that was the, uh, um, <laughs> that was exactly the point, <laughs> you know, right there in a nutshell is, is the, is the, point of this whole exercise here. We want to correct errors like that. So I control R now resets that slur to its default, uh, gets rid of those manual adjustments. And now I will use shift right to extend it properly. And I can tell the other slurs are equally messed up. So I can select that one, control R to reset it. And then shift R, I mean, shift right to fix it. Now, are the other slurs similarly bad? Okay, so this one here looks like it might be correct. I'm gonna hit Control R and it, it is correct. However, I say it's correct, but I look at this slur here on the second system and I am I have issues with it. The rules for slur placement are tricky. Um, when they go above, when they go below the staff and how, where they end on the staff. And normally slurs do go on the note head side if all the stems are the same direction. But in this case, uh, that's putting the slur between the staves and it's kind of making those staves look kind of further apart than they need to be because it's kind of pushing that hairpin away also, right? 
Um, so I'm not crazy with that stem with that slur direction on the second system there. Now I need to check the original. Yeah, notice how the original has flipped that slur above. I absolutely want to do that. So control X flip. I mean, not X, not control X, just X flips it above. While I'm at it, I feel like I just want to fix the rest of these slurs. I'm just going to select them all because I know he's messed up all these slurs, right? So I'm going to uh, right click one, say select. <coughs> Similar, and then Control R. That resets them all, and now I will refix that one that I just flipped above. I can see another one two systems later that needs to be flipped. So I feel like those are two really good improvements I just made. <coughs> all right. So the other things, though, that I had noticed that I do want to address about this first system is the pedal line and the uh, um, the fingering. I'm going to deal with the fingering first because it's easier. The fingers are just missing. Right? The original has fingerings, five, two, one, two. And the the uh, the MuseScore version doesn't have any fingerings. I want fingerings. So I'm going to go to add text fingering. And notice I have defined a custom shortcut for this to make it easier to do, control shift F. Slurs wrong on measure nine. Okay, I'll fix that. Um, oh, yeah, because I, I reset them, but I still need to shift write them to extend them. So absolutely, I'll need to do that. So control shift F will also allow me to enter fingering. But now I can type five, oops, five space, two space, one space, two. And now I've got my fingerings in there. Now, the observation was made in the post that started this whole thing here that a common mistake uh, in the experience of Jeannie, who was, um, who was the person who posted this, is for people to enter fingerings as staff text instead of actual fingerings. Now, I haven't actually encountered that very often. I, 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 I really don't see people entering fingerings as staff text very often. Um, however, I'm now wondering if one reason is, is if Jeannie has been mostly transcribing a particular set of music, like, you know, it, it, she's like, the, this comes from a particular, the Trinity College, uh, whatever it was, um, the Trinity College, something or other, um, London. Yeah, so it's part of their sight reading exam or training, you know, some something associated with Trinity College. And someone like this Nathan guy uh, has probably gone through and transcribed a bunch of these things. And so it's possible that it's really the same person making that mistake over and over again that Jeannie has been seeing, or at least a small number of people making that mistake. So I'm not totally sure, but I'm, I have a suspicion that that's why sometimes she's been seeing staff text instead of fingerings. But in any case, if that had been staff text instead of fingerings, I would have had to delete them and re-add them. There's not an automatic way of converting them. Um, okay. So these slurs are now all the wrong length. So yeah, I need to take these guys and shift right them. And I don't know how many others there are that that's going to need to happen with, but I, I would address that when we get there. But now I want to finally deal with this pedal marking. So the thing is, now we're going to come back to the subject of correctness. And let me again save my score because I like liking what I've done so far. Notice what the original has. It has that pedal marking, and then it has that, you know, that angle brackety thing. You know, that angle brackety thing. And then it just says simile. The idea being that that angle bracket is the quick change, right? That That's where you go. Well, it's not boom. Is my hand working for you there? I, I lift my hand up at the moment, boom, 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 lift, and I lift and immediately put the piano down. And that's what this angle bracket means. And they've actually indicated this incorrectly. This angle bracket doesn't go on the bar line. It goes on the note. But normally that's what happens. You have the angle bracket and then you, uh, you know, you then you show that. But they didn't want to clutter the page with a bunch of pedal markings. So they just put in one and then wrote in simile. Um, the person who transcribed this, Nathan, has just said the pedal ends there. Well, that's not really the same thing. Oh, you can't see my hand. I was thinking, well, not on the screen share, but, you know, the little thumbnail on the left. 
unless maybe you've full screened it, I don't know, but the um, the little thumbnail on the left should be showing my hand. But in any case, um, foot is down, up, down. So I, I'm up, down is that little motion of lifting your foot and putting it back down, calling you know how to play the piano. So, um, but for anyone else who, who also couldn't see it um, and was not sure what I was talking about, yeah, it's that up, down motion. So this is an issue in that if we want to make this pedal correct from the perspective of playback, we don't want to just put it in once and then write simile. Um, uh, because if you do that, then um, it won't play back pedal after that first bar. You'll want to actually put the pedal in on every bar. Um, and yet that's going to make it cluttered. If you make all the other ones invisible, which is what I would normally do if I wanted to optimize for correct playback, I would add pedal markings throughout the score and then mark all of them invisible after the first one. That's probably going to clutter the music XML export. And you'll have to make that same decision about like a Braille translation. Do you want to put all those pedal markings in the Braille translation or do you just want to do the same trick of not including them and putting in simile. That'll be a decision to make. So what I think I'm going to do for now is just fix the pedal marking to look like that. So I'm going to take that pedal marking. I'm going to extend it. Oh, I'm not going to extend it. I'm just going to take that that uh, vertical bar there. And I'm going to go to properties and change it to the angle bracket. And then I extend it to make sure it actually does end on the first note. And well, that's weird. Let me wait a minute. Control R. It. Oh, okay. So he did some more adjustments of it. All right. I'm going to delete that guy and just re add it. He did the same thing there of just dragging the thing. So I'm going to do the same trick here. I'm going to select from the F sharp to the F sharp in the next measure. And now go to the palettes, go to the keyboard palette, add that pedal marking. And now I will change that angle bracket to uh, the angle. And now it ends where it's supposed to on the note. Then I can create my next one and do the same thing and make it uh, have be this one that starts and ends with an angle bracket. And so, yeah, when I've added this one here, it shows the change and shows it continuing. Uh, then I could put the simile here. If I want to get the simile there on the second bar, I'm going to have to play some games. So let's take a look at this, how I'm going to play that game. Um, I think I am going to take that pedal marking, go to properties, and change its end hook to not have an end hook. And now I'm going to do, I'm going to shift, I'm going to select that end and shift left to shorten it so it's as short as possible and call that good. I like this better, right? The PDF just has the end hook and then just sort of stops there. It doesn't have a line continuing at all. I like how this looks better with the uh, line continuing horizontally there. So now I got to get the word simile in there and simile is expression text. So I'm going to use control E to add it. And now I have a choice. I'm either going to add it to the F sharp and then drag it or otherwise move it out of the way of the pedal line, or I could add it to the next note. I'm, you know, here is one where normally uh, if this was a dynamic marking or anything else, I would be really insistent on attaching it to the right note. But in this case, I don't know that it matters. Simile means keep doing the same thing. And whether you put it on this note or on the next note, it's going to mean the same thing either way. So I'm not super convinced it matters whether that simile is attached to the F sharp or to the C sharp. But I guess for the sake of demonstration, I, well, yeah, I, I could do it either way. I could either control E and add the word sim uh, here on the C sharp, or I could control X and control V to add it to the F sharp. Either way, notice it doesn't align with the pedal marking. The pedal marking is trying to avoid that fingering. So it's actually kind of low on the page where simile doesn't need to avoid anything. So it's able to be higher. So either way, I'm probably going to need to manually adjust the position of this to visually uh, look like it aligns with the pedal marking. And I'm just going to live with that. I'm just going to live with the fact that yes, if I move this thing over a little bit and then down a little bit, it'll more or less line up something like that. And 
call that good enough. Is that the exact, like, you know, is that manual adjustment going to look exactly perfect if I then delete that line break? Or is it going to have the same problem as the slur? Well, probably. Yeah, now that sim is a little too far away. You know, that's, that is one of the uh, decisions you have to make when you make these manual adjustments just to get things to visually work out. So um, you do have to accept that those manual adjustments aren't necessarily going to make sense if the layout changes. And why would the layout change? Well, think about Think about also the, uh, the the tip that I gave in my newsletter this week about making a large print edition of this. I might make a large print edition of this and set my uh, um, uh, staff space to be 3.25 uh, millimeters. And when I do that, oops, I hit escape instead of okay. If I make this 3.25, and hit OK. Oops, I, I, I'm I'm hitting I'm hitting Enter, which accepts the spin box, but it doesn't press the OK button, uh, and I can't see the OK button because it's hidden behind my uh, pin thing. That's how I'm messing up there. One more time, three point two five, and this time click OK. So now that simile adjustment again is the wrong place, right? So anytime you make those sorts of manual adjustments, you are you are um, taking a chance that it's not going to look correct after adjust after you make um, formatting changes. So at this point, I have to reconcile that, you know, that formatting. Do I care about those formatting changes or do I care about correctness from a music XML export uh, more? I like the fact that the sim is correct, is connected to the right uh -huh. note, is connected to the F sharp. That manual adjustment not looking good after a formatting change, I might just live with because at least the sim is attached to the right note. But again, it doesn't matter what note that sim is attached to really. So I could put it on the C sharp and be happy to. This is a judgment call where, you know, this correctness business is kind of relative. There's some things you just care more about than other things. All right, I'm gonna save this now because I have finished, I believe, that first system and uh, would say that, you know, that's as much as I think I need to care about here because after that, it's gonna be a lot more of the same, right? Everything that you've seen me do is the same kind of stuff that I'm gonna keep doing throughout this score. So yeah, there was a lot of in uh, things about my process of proofing, process of discovering what was wrong, process of correcting, and how I made some of the judgment calls I made. So yeah, it was a lot of sort of cross-section of different aspects of new score and score creation. And so uh, yeah, hopefully people have found this session interesting and useful. Um, but there you go. So that all said, let's come back and hear some theme music. Mm -hmm. So thanks everyone for being here. And uh, Chris, I, you asked what kind of text I used. I used expression text. Um, and okay, that is that is worth talking about in itself. I used expression text simply because the original it's below the staff and it's italic, just like expressions normally are. But expression text is really for stuff like dolce, right? Stuff that's kind of like a dynamic marking, but not really. And it's and it goes where dynamics go and it's italics and below the staff. This simile is really not, it's not expression in that same way, but it's positioned and formatted the same way as expression text. So I used control E. I just as well could have used control T staff text and then manually made it italic and manually flipped it below the staff. Lots of things I could have done for that. Unfortunately, the word simile, you know, it's, it really means do the same thing as the previous marking. And so it should have the same formatting as that previous marking in a lot of cases. And so there's not necessarily a correct answer when it comes to the word simile. It's, it, is a, it is a wild card as far as these things go. So anyhow, uh, interesting session to me because I learned a few things here. And so I thank you, uh, Peter, and thank you, Steinar, for the observations. And uh, yeah, tomorrow we'll be looking at some music. And uh, in the Music Masterclass, hope to see you then. And remember, heads up, uh, Saturday in September, probably the 23rd, be looking for an announcement about a workshop and uh, um, 
you'll be hearing more about that soon. So thanks, everyone, and see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.